Tonight we have a very special guest, Matt Rogers. Um, so Matt was one of the co-founders of Nest. Uh, before that, he was responsible for uh, software development on the iPod, which I'm sure a few people have heard about. So um, you have him to thank for it. So without further ado, uh, let's welcome Matt Rogers. Thank you. Thanks. So, excellent. Yes, so uh, most of you guys, well, so I shall ask. So, uh, how many people have heard of Nest already? Okay, pretty pretty good crowd. Then. All right, excellent. Uh, what, you know, depends on how much detail I go into. Do I need to talk? You know, what is the company? But you guys got it. So, uh, unloved devices. So, uh, we did thermostats, and uh, before we launched, uh, very few people knew what we were doing. We were actually super secretive about it. But the few people we did talk about, uh, talk to about it, uh, be it friends, family, people we were hiring. Uh, you know, friends in the industry uh, thought we were nuts, like literally crazy. And uh, actually, some of the first investor pitches we did, uh, they said, like, Lily, this is what you guys come to talk to us about? Like, so, like, Tony and I would go, we'd be like, we have this great idea, we have a great pitch for you guys, we go in, we wouldn't tell them what it was, and then we'd, we'd, we'd tell them a little bit of the story, like, thermostats? And then we'd tell them a little bit more of the story, like, oh, this could be really big. Oh, and it's half of home energy? Oh, okay, interesting. And uh, eventually, uh, a, few, a few great guys bought in, but uh, uh, very much the unloved. And that's what I want to talk to you guys about, about uh, the unloved and uh, innovation and how these two things actually go hand in hand and uh, how things become unloved. So stagnation. So uh, fortunately, thermostats were pretty much the most stagnant industry in existence. I mean, heating and cooling is pretty much the most boring thing around, uh, but why? So, like, what causes this? Like, what goes into it? Uh, how do we get here? Uh, so, for our industry, we got here uh, about 100 years ago. So, there's this, a small, at the time, it was about a small company in uh, Minneapolis uh, called Honeywell. And they did this first uh, electric, no, it wasn't even electrical. At that time, it was a mechanical, like, kind of uh, thermal switch based on mercury and uh, thermal expansion to kind of give people an idea of what temperature it was and how to control it. And uh, that technology changed a little bit over the years, but uh, not too much. Uh, but why? Like, why didn't it change? Why didn't they change it? Uh, why didn't they update it? Why didn't they add new technology? And why didn't they change with the times? And the answer is they really didn't need to. So uh, even today, even with Nest, they have about 70% market share. Uh, they have you know, a 50-something billion dollar market cap, uh, kind of resources and products. Uh, across multiple industries, like their biggest industries, aerospace and uh, missiles. So very different than kind of consumer tech in the home. Uh, and you can imagine that uh, things get lost pretty easily in a company that large. Uh, you know, like why would you focus on this small $39, $49 dollar product that's selling you know, 10 million a year uh, when you have giant defense contracts to do? And uh, the interesting thing is we see parallels in other industries. So this is not just new for us. This is new. This is a uh, a general thing, and it's kind of the trend of Silicon Valley. Like, what is Silicon Valley great at? It's finding these kind of unloved, uh, stagnant niches and attacking it head on and building something great. Uh, so a few examples, some from my past and some that I think were uh, a great parallel to what we kind of thought through at Nest. So uh, some of you guys probably remember this. So uh, uh, <laughs> many people probably don't know what this is. So uh, this is the Rio. Uh, it came out, I'm going to say 1998, and I was one of the few that bought one. Uh, it had like 16 megabytes of memory, and you, you loaded over USB. It held like 10 songs, uh, and uh, that that was it was a really cool thing. You could carry 10 songs in your pocket instead of having a CD player. Uh, and that, and it, it was it was a cool product. It was very new, uh, but you could you, you you could see how how that is a industry ready for disruption. So music. So before you used to buy these tapes. Uh, and then tapes evolved into these CDs. But in essence, they were about the same thing. Like you'd have kind of 10 or 20 songs that you'd carry around and you'd listen. Walkman was selling, I don't even know the numbers. They were doing probably 50 million units a year, 40 million units a year, some ridiculous number. It's a gigantic industry. And Sony was the king of the hill. So it's like Sony was one of the, one of the biggest technology companies of the 1980s, hands down, the biggest. Uh, very different than, than today. Uh, this guy. So uh, circa 2005, uh, RIM was king of the hill. Uh, they were shipping the most mass smartphones in existence, uh, albeit smartphones were a fairly niche market. 
uh, uh, and they had basically captured the entire consumer and business segment of the market uh, with this product. Or maybe it was the one before this. Uh, the vacuum cleaner. So why did I put this in here? Uh, it's not really a tech product. Uh, people have them. There's probably one in every home in America and probably one in most homes in the, in the, in the world. Uh, it's really not changed much. Uh, it just it kind of sucks dirt off the floor. You push it around. Uh, how can you how can you make that better, right? Uh, but somebody did, and I want to talk about that. Uh, so the spark. So like you see these kind of things, and why would you want to make it better? Uh, and my co-founder he, he he likes to tell the story about frustration. So uh, him and I have very different personalities. Uh, he's kind of the, he's the, the bad cop. I'm the good cop. Uh, I'm I'm the, the the happy guy on the team, and he's like the frustrated like, pulling his hair out. Like we got to make this better. Uh, and one of the things he always says is, like, innovation comes out of my frustration. Like, these things are so bad that we have to make it better. Uh, I, I come at it from a fairly different perspective. Uh, you, you, try, you try to find the, the best everywhere and see how you could do the best even better. Uh, but I, I, I like his frustration comment because that's, that's how Nest got started. Uh, so we got started uh, two and a half years ago? Holy shit. Almost three years ago. So... Uh, Tony had left Apple a little bit before me, and uh, I was still at Apple doing iPod and iPhone stuff. Uh, having a great time was my dream job. I, I, ever since I was a little kid, wanted to work at Apple. I had an old Mac Plus in like 1985 or six, and grew up you know, on, on the Mac, and uh, it was my dream job, you know, landing at Apple right out of college. Uh, and in 2009, I was running three or four different teams doing iPod and iPhone and iPad software. I was loving my job. Uh, but there was some frustration, and I love how Tony always says this. So the frustration with kind of how fast a big company could possibly move, and uh, can we innovate faster, and can you do something else other than iPod version 11, and iPod, and iPad version 5, and iPhone version 7, and all those kind of things. And uh, frustration led to, well, maybe we should start our own company. So uh, Tony and I got together, we, we had lunch, and said, Tony, I want to start a company. I want to do the smart home. He's like, no fucking way. We're not doing that. We're not doing the smart home. The smart home is for geeks. It's never going to go big. Uh, no way. We're never, ever going to do the smart home. This is funny because it's funny how things come around. Uh, and Tony always is a way of putting, putting things. Uh, and I said, OK, well, then, then if not the smart home, then what? It, it, we, we, we had both been doing research. And he said, well, I've been thinking a lot about this. And I'm building this house. Uh, he built some fancy house up in Tahoe with kind of the best. After you retire from Apple with lots of money, like what do you do? You build a giant mansion. And uh, his giant mansion had like solar panels and geothermal heat pumps and all this crazy stuff and kind of the best you could buy. And he spent like $25,000 on this heating equipment. And his architect said, well, these are the thermostats you could pick to control this. And it was a round thing, it was a square thing, and it was all this kind of white plastic and all pretty dumb and you couldn't really do much with it. And it just didn't make a lot of sense. So he's like, we could do a thermostat. And I'm like, we could do a thermostat. We, built the iPod, certainly we could build a thermostat. And he's like, well, how, he's like, how about this? How we put together a small team, five or six guys, we do it in six months, just knock it out. It's funny how he said that. It's, it's going to be easy, right? Uh, it turns out it was it's not easy. Uh, but it kind of it sparked a discussion. Say, well, well, if, if we can't find a good thermostat, regardless of how much you want to spend, like, how is everyone else doing this? And we basically spent the next six months looking at the industry. And uh, we learned that, one, it's the biggest energy controller in the home, half of home energy in the United States. In, in Europe, it's even more. 60, 70% of your home energy is heating. Uh, it's a big deal. Uh, people spend on the order of magnitude of $1,100 a year in the US on heating and cooling costs, which is like more than your cell phone, it's more than your cable, cable bill, it's more than some people spend on gas. But yet, people spend a lot of time thinking about their phone and their cable and their internet and their car. Uh, why are they thinking about thermostats? And uh, it leads to the question of, of why did no one think about this? And uh, I think a lot of it has to do with uh, how industries are structured. And uh, the incumbents are often not incentivized to innovate. I mean, they're selling a great product at high margins uh, in huge volumes. Uh, why would you change? Like, why would you want to change that industry? Uh, you're, you're milking it. Like, uh, like, like, you hear a lot about like growth. And you know, startups want to grow. And they hire a bunch of a growth team to figure out how to grow the business. But when you get really big, uh, and it's really hard to grow more, like when you're growing at five or 10% a year, uh, what do you do next? And it's kind of like you're in defense mode. You wanna make sure that you don't lose your position. Uh, and you get kind of penalized for taking big risks because you could lose that business. So I understand how companies get in that position. Uh, 
and it's very difficult to, to, to avoid it. And I, at, the, at the end, I'll talk a little bit about like, things that I think I've learned over the years and that uh, we learned from Apple as to not get in that position. How do you not become stagnant? Uh, uh, but but uh, back to thermostats. So I uh, never thought I'd be having a whole conversation about thermostats, by the way. This is, whole thing is bizarre. I, 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 I'm looking forward to one day like, ha having as interesting a conversation about something even more boring. <laughs> so uh, innovation. So like, we knew that we could do this thing better. Uh, we surveyed the whole landscape. Uh, we looked at basically every competitive product. We looked at research technologies, things in the university, uh, and there was nothing. Like, God, there's nothing out there. Like, there, we, were, we were right. Like, we can't buy anything. We can't, we can't do anything. We got to do it ourselves. So in kind of spring 2010, we put together kind of a skeleton team, uh, one from each key discipline, and, uh, it, and kind of the whole broad spectrum of it you know, comes to build a company. Right? Mechanical engineering, electrical engineering, firmware, uh, OS guys, networking guys, cloud guys, applications guys, a marketing guy, and a manufacturing guy. So that was kind of the early team. Uh, we hired a lot of guys that we knew already. So uh, most of the guys in the early team are from Apple, and some of that's held true today. We're all good friends now. It's OK. Uh, and, put, and put kind of our thinking caps on in terms of how we would do it differently. And we would decide literally to blow the whole thing up and start over. We'll get back to that. So uh, the iPod. So how do you get to here from here? Uh, there was a little, so this, this is like a seven-year delta, so it's not really a fair comparison. Uh, but but in, in between was the hard drive, like right over here. Uh, and this is this, uh, you know, I, I don't know if you guys have heard kind of the early iPod stories. Uh, uh, my my co-founder, Tony, had this really good idea. Instead of storing your 16 songs on a really expensive small piece of flash, why don't you use a really big hard drive and just protect it and use a lot of smart software to make sure that hard drive is off most of the time. So you can store more songs, but have kind of the reliability of a mobile product. It was a crazy idea. He pitched it to a bunch of different companies. Most kind of walked him out the door saying, hey, that's funny. Yeah, this thing's never going to take off. Uh, and uh, there was a really smart guy at Apple named Steve Jobs who thought it was a great idea and decided let's build a product out of it. And, and that's kind of how the iPod was born. There's a lot of great, I, I, I can talk about the iPod all day, but uh, there's a lot of really good stories there, but uh, doing things differently. So. Okay, there's a lot of buttons here. There's an A, B button, there's a repeat button, there's a random button, there's this wheel here with four or five different things, there's some things up top. Uh, uh, how many buttons do you need to play music, right? You need a play button, you need skip, forward, back, and maybe you want to change the volume. What, what else do you really need? Like, the rest of it's kind of fluff, right? Uh, and this is kind of the, the, the great epiphany is, if you design a great user interface, something that's really simple that anybody could pick up and use, uh, that that's kind of the path to mass adoption. It's not kind of adding more features and more things like this. So in our, in our industry, uh, in, in thermostats, they used to have all these buttons for like programming the day of the week. And this is heat, cool, off switch. And there's a fan on auto switch. What does that even mean, <laughs> right? On or auto. I don't, I, to this day, we still don't understand what it means. Uh, but yeah, so like often like uh, incumbents, uh, just keep on adding from where they were, and this is where you end up. And even from the early iPod days, if you take the kind of the first, first generation from 2000, uh, it looks a lot like this, albeit a little bigger, a little bit thicker, and battery life was not as good, and the hard drive sometimes didn't work when you ran. Uh, but, but we evolved. And uh, by 2006, this thing was, 2005, this thing was hopping. And uh, we were selling, I think, 20 million of these a year. So that's a, that's a pretty good market, and uh, that market continued to grow. I mean, I think by the time I left Apple, we were doing something like 50 or 60 million iPods a year. So, some crazy, that's obviously tapered off now. Actually, it's declined probably 20 to 30% off that high number uh, because of uh, what I'm going to talk about next. So how do you prevent someone else from uh, out-innovating you is you do it yourself, and you, replace, you have to be not afraid to replace yourself, and we do that with this. So... Again, I love this. So many buttons. So like, like same, same kind of story. Like, people, like, people need physical keyboards. You can't text. You can't email. You can't surf the web with, without a physical keyboard. You have to have it. Every smartphone to date at this point had one of these, and they were gigantic. They were monsters. And they had these little small screens that were really hard to read and small. And you know, that kind of defeats the whole point. You want to have a giant user interface so you can see everything you're doing. You want to be able to read the whole email or 
view the web page. They had, I, I don't know how many guys, how many people owned smartphones before this? So about 30. Uh, interesting. So uh, when you browse the web on one of these guys, you got this kind of neutered version, version of the web. They, they, they had this whole, like, was it WAP or whatever it is? Uh, uh, bizarre. Like, why would you want to view the web through this filtered glass? Like, why not view the web in its natural state? And that was kind of the big epiphany uh, that many of the designers had on this guy is, why not just view it as it is? And that worked really, really well. Uh, how many people own one of these? OK, so that's uh, about 20x. So that's, that's pretty good. That's, a, that's, that's not bad for two years or so. Uh, but yeah, so uh, this came about not just to innovate uh, in kind of outdo and outdesign and uh, outsmart RIM. It was to outdo, outdesign, outsmart ourselves. And that was kind of the, we, we, we knew, it's not like this is a kind of a big secret. Like we knew at the time that we were going to replace ourselves. And that was a very conscious decision. Uh, single use devices. Like, we knew they were going to die. And we knew that we had to uh, out-innovate ourselves. I mean, we, we did a new iPod every year. We wanted to always stay ahead of ourselves, because uh, if we didn't, uh, someone else would make a better iPod. But how do you make the kind of the 10x leap? Like, how do you out? I, I don't know if you guys read any of Larry Page's interview of Wired. It was really good. Uh, just posted sometime this week. Uh, he talked about doing 10% increases or 10x increases. And at Google, they don't even look for 10% increases. They look for 10x's. And that's, that, that's how we felt, too. I mean, it's not about doing kind of a little bit better. It's about doing a lot better. Uh, and that's kind of where this came about. Awesome product. Uh, but vacuum cleaners. So like, how do you make a better vacuum cleaner? Uh, you just kind of push it on the floor, and it sucks, right? Well, you can make it a lot easier to push. Uh, and you can make it suck a lot better. And uh, you can make it ergonomic. Uh, you can make it look good. Uh, I'll be, I think I love their design, but it, it's, it, it's at least different than this that my, so my grandma's house, uh, she has the exact same vacuum cleaner she had from the 1950s, and it's a metal version of this. Like, it looks exactly the same. It, it, like, it, like, the parallel of uh, my grandma's house has this Honeywell round that's metal, and now people have this plastic Honeywell round thing. Uh, same parallel. Uh, and Dyson did an amazing job of it. So can we take something that's incredibly boring, incredibly stagnant, but a big industry. So Dyson's doing a billion dollars of vacuums a year now. That's crazy. It's vacuum cleaners, right? Like, why would you go do that? Uh, it's because, one, you can do it better. Uh, like you could uh, build a better product and solve a, uh, solve a real problem. Like, getting things clogged up, cat and dog hair, all those kind of things. These products don't really work. You could do it better. And uh, Dyson captured a market uh, of people who appreciate design. So this is not a, this is not a new thing. Albeit, uh, I feel like our generation treats it like it's a new thing. But uh, people appreciate design. Uh, people spend a lot of money on art, on painting their home, on their furniture, on the clothes they wear. Uh, why shouldn't they spend money on the other things in their home that should be designed? That's kind of the premise behind Nest, too. So, yes, so sometimes that's not enough. Sometimes small jumps are not, big, are not good enough, right? Uh, and sometimes you have to go really big. And, uh, these guys have done something really big. Uh, I, and sometimes it's hard for me to even appreciate how big this is. Like, I, I'm in a similar industry in that I build products that are physical and they're connected, but this is an entirely different scale. So how many of you guys have been to the Tesla factory? A couple. So it is a, <laughs> excellent, it is a magical experience. So I, I used to live in factories in China. Uh, uh, it, it, it is a different order of magnitude. So uh, Elon and team have literally gone to another level. Like, it's hard for me even to explain in words. So uh, you walk in this factory, and it's clean. Uh, and it's beautiful. Like, they've designed it. Like, the robots all have beautiful Tesla painted on it. Uh, it, it, it it's mechanized. Like, there's lots of robots. There's not a lot of people walking around. Uh, it's mostly these giant, like, armed robots that pick up tools. They pick up a different tool, and they do a job, and they put the tool back, and they pick something else up. And it's super cool. Uh, and it's made in Fremont. Like, no one makes cars in Fremont, <laughs> right? Uh, and it's electric, and it's beautiful, and it's sexy. Uh, and if you look at the dash, it looks like it was designed by someone who understands technology. Like, uh, different order of magnitude. So uh, not your conventional car company, not even kind of an incremental car company. This is a kind of a, a 10x car company, uh, as, as Larry said in his interview. And, 
uh, sometimes you have to do that. Like sometimes the, these, the small increments, sometimes uh, this is not enough. And sometimes you have to go, you have to go crazy. Like you have to spend $5 billion to build a, a car factory and hire thousands of people to totally reinvent an industry. Uh, and now people are following, which is this, is, this is a crazy thing. So Tesla, relatively small company, thousands of employees, small for car company, uh, three and a half billion dollar market cap, uh, are now being copied by all the, all the greats, like Nissan, Ford, GM, BMW, all are now doing their own kind of new technology electric car, albeit they're not getting the design as well. It's not as good. Uh, the performance, not as good. The range, not as good. Uh, and by the time they come up with a car as good, Tesla will have done three more since then. So uh, in terms of how do you prevent stagnation, you just keep going. You keep doing it. Like You don't rest on your laurels. Uh, you keep building, and you keep building better, and you keep beating yourself. Uh, like one of the things that we always tell our team is uh, we should be our own worst critics. Like We shouldn't rely on our users to give us UI feedback. We shouldn't rely on our users to find the bugs. We need to do it ourselves. Like We need to be our own worst critics. We need to tear up our own designs. Uh, like people ask me if we do a lot of user testing. We do, we do some. We, you know, it's a thermostat. We want to make sure it works in homes. Uh, but in terms of our, like, our design process and, and, and the actual product that we make, we don't ask people what they think about it. Uh, we tear it up ourselves. Uh, for the first generation, we did how many did we do? I'd say we did probably 30 different ID models the first go. And we threw all 30 away. And we did it, and we started over again. Uh, we had this whole wall uh, full of kind of foam and SLAs, and we threw them all away. They were not good enough. We started fresh again. Uh, this industry. I, 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 love, I love this picture. It kind of tells the whole story. So uh, 1960. Uh, how many people still have this today? Oh, less than I thought. You guys must buy Nest, right? <laughs> it's, it's a good crowd. <laughs> yes, but uh, uh, a lot of people still have these. 1960. Like, how many people still own gadgets from 1960? Probably none, right? Uh, and if you look kind of over the years, what's changed? So nothing. Nothing. Ooh, programmability. Like, you could you could build a schedule. So you could have the thermostat turned down automatically based on a schedule uh, at your preset times. Again. Look at these buttons. Uh, I mean, it's a little blurry, but uh, would you know what to do? And in fact, most people didn't know what to do. Uh, I'd never actually realized those savings you could program. So this is what? Uh, pretty much the same thing. Oh, OK. Uh, this is cool. Uh, they took these buttons and mapped them onto a touch screen. <laughs> it's great, right? It's great. And it's green. Uh, and, and actually, this is a big seller. Uh, like Home Depot and Lowe's sell a lot of these guys. Uh, they sell for like 79 89 bucks. So sometimes as much as 149. Uh, in terms of what differentiates those different price skews, nothing. They're pretty much the same. Uh, and then this guy, holy cow! This is this is the behemoth. This, they're very proud of this. So this is uh, 599. Uh, uh, requires professional installation. And again, you, they map these buttons onto this interface and add weather. Very cool. <laughs> so what do you do? Uh, you blow it up, right? Like. It, Ignore it. Like pr pretend none of this stuff existed. How would you do it from scratch? Uh, uh, and that's exactly what we did. So again, I talked about foundational research. So it's not just enough to build a great design, but it has to make sense for people. It has to add value. So uh, we ran some models. So uh, starting today, next 20 years, how much are people going to spend on residential energy? And on average, we, we expect that about $47,000 per home over the next 20 years. So it's a pretty big number. Uh, and why is that? So uh, for the most part, uh, devices use a lot of energy. And very few people actually look to these kind of standards for uh, what could be uh, more efficient, more economical. People really recognize these. CFL light bulbs are like, these things are great. Uh, they're going to cut down your 100 watt light bulb to 30 watts. Huge savings, right? Uh, it turns out actually not so much. Uh, th this is kind of the, the, the chart here uh, in aggregate kind of for the US of where your energy goes. Uh, and uh, yeah, yeah low-hanging fruit, right? Uh, if you're going to solve the home energy problem, uh, this is the guy. So we, were, we, we knew we were on the right track. We were, we were totally on the right track. We had to solve this problem. I mean, so I, 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 I forgot to mention. So uh, getting started, uh, we wanted to do something good. 
So it wasn't enough to just to build a great gadget that's well designed and solves a real problem. Uh, we wanted to do something good. And when I say good, I mean like good for humanity. Uh, in part, part of what went into the founding of Nest is, can we take all of our skills, put them together, and solve an epic problem? Uh, and this is an epic problem. So uh, residential is about 20% of all US energy usage, kind of by pie chart, industrial, transportation, commercial. Uh, so 20%. And half of that uh, is controlled by this guy, which hasn't changed since really 1960. Uh, wow, that's fucked up. Yeah. So the, the promise is this. So that if you buy uh, one of these programmable types and you actually program a schedule, you could save about 20% a year. Uh, it's a big number, right? There's very few things that you could spend $49 on or $59 on and save this kind of money. It's very rare. Uh, the question is, can you actually do it? And uh, yeah, most people can't. So uh, this, is a, this is a fairly old stat, but I think there's 110 million homes in the US today. But uh, it's a pretty big number. The US is a large country. Uh, programmable thermostats uh, have about 44% penetration after 30 years, 40 years. Uh, it's pretty bad, by the way. That's, that's astonishing. But why? It's because, as I said, most people aren't programming them. They're not actually saving energy. Uh, this is the kind of founding stat that we relied on when we started the company. Uh, most people weren't, weren't programming the thermostat. Holy cow, how can we solve this problem? Uh, oh, God, what we do? Uh, yeah. Uh, and the way you do it is you just freaking blow it up. And uh, we're like, OK, we know what we need to do. What do you need to see when you're controlling your temperature? You need to see what the temperature is, uh, and you need a dial to change it. And that's really it. Right? Everything else is, is not necessary. So uh, we added this cool leaf, and the leaf tells you when you've picked a good temperature, when you're actually saving energy. It's not a graph. It's not a chart. It doesn't give you any dollars. It's just a little reminder that you picked something better than it was before. Uh, and that's really all we did. And you turn the dial, tick moves, tell, tells, you the, tells you your new set point. That's it. Uh, and you don't have to program it. Uh, for those 11% who really want to, they can. Uh, but why should you have to do it here? And why should you use this little screen on your wall that's about this big to program a schedule, which is a fairly complicated task? Right? People have done calendar apps for the last 30 years, and they're hard to do. Uh, I, yeah, some of you guys have probably done calendar apps. They're really hard. Uh, why should you have to put a calendar app on this little tiny screen to try to put, fit all the buttons right here? It doesn't really make a lot of sense, right? Uh, so we put. For people who want to do it, you can do it on your iPhone, do it on your iPad, do it on the web. For those who you don't, which is 90% of the population, we'll learn from you. So as you turn the dial, we learn your patterns. It's great. I mean, that's the promise of Nest, and that's what we spent literally like two years developing. It was, uh, it was literally rocket science. So uh, I studied at Carnegie Mellon. I, actually, I, some of you guys probably were too. Uh, and I studied under Yoki Matsuoka in the RI. Uh, and she did AI and robotics, biomedical stuff. Crazy rocket scientist, MacArthur Fellow, uh, self-driving cars at Google, uh, robots that you can control with your brain, crazy stuff. Uh, and, I, 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 and I called her up, and I'm like, Yoki, I need help. I don't know how to do AI. I don't know machine learning. I don't know how to make a, a thermostat that can program itself. I need help. Uh, so she quit her job at the time co-leading uh, Google X with Sebastian uh, and joined Nest to build the brains behind the thermostat. And uh, that went pretty well. It, it actually works, which is it blows my mind still to this day that in two and a half years, we went from basically zero to significant market penetration in a second generation product already. So I mentioned this earlier. So like, how do you prevent this kind of brutal spiral of like 10% improvements, just trying to play defense? Uh, and uh, I think it's, you have to play your, your own defense. You have to play your own offense. You have to do it yourself. And you have to be willing to risk your own business to do the next thing. And actually, you can see uh, like even large, successful companies who have followed the strategy have failed to do the same strategy. So uh, Apple has been really good about replacing themselves. They replaced the Mac, right? They replaced the iPod, uh, iTunes. So uh, I, iTunes got Spotified, right? Uh, like, like everyone saw this coming. So you got to do subscription music, something, something free and something paid. Uh, Apple, Apple didn't do it. Uh, they could have done it, right? You know, there's no reason why they couldn't have done it, but they got Spotify. And now Spotify is on its way to being the largest music store in the world, right? Uh, and Apple could have done that, but they didn't. Like, they they uh, didn't want to risk their business. They didn't want to keep moving forward. And uh, uh, that's, that, that's what happened. Someone else will do it if you don't. 
Uh, and as you guys are building your companies, it is important to think about that sometimes you need to risk it yourself in order to do it, right? I know it's hard. Like, uh, it's hard to tell your board, and this is why a lot of big companies this happens to. Like, it's hard for the CEO to get up in front of his board and saying, we're going to risk 20% of our revenue this year to go do this, do this other thing. Uh, we're going to blow up our, our biggest business to go do this, this other thing. Uh, but sometimes you have to do it, and that's, that's a big bet. Uh, it's a big bet that uh, has paid off for some and has caused the downfall of some companies. So have you guys ever heard of Xerox? Right? Uh, right like, like, uh, well, what else? Kodak? Right? 1980s, one of the biggest companies in the world, very well respected, top of their game. I think they're, they're bankrupt. So they've sold their patents off. They're kind of done. Nortel? Uh, that's a combination of some scandals and some other stuff. But uh, right, like, like if, if, you, if you aren't willing to take the big bets, uh, sometimes uh, you're done. And uh, for us, I mean, we're always worried about what's behind us. So uh, new startup, we were about 70 people. We just launched. Uh, we get together saying, all right, guys, what are we doing next? Uh, let's do it again. Like, we, we, just, we just shipped literally last week. What are we going to do? Let's do it again. Uh, there's some things we weren't happy about. We wanted to make better. We wanted to make it more compatible, work in more homes. We will make the design even simpler. We learned a lot. And if we didn't do it, somebody else would. Somebody else would follow us. We're always waiting for someone who's going to be the next killer. So let's out-innovate ourselves. And by the time someone has copied what we just did, uh, we already had something else out. And it turns out they didn't have anything. They didn't even copy our first one yet. Uh, but one day they will. And uh, we'll be on generation five by then. Have 10 other things. And maybe have even out-invented ourselves. We don't even need one of these. You never know. So things that we did. So, in the first generation, we had this grill here. With, uh, like, it was a metal grill with lots of holes. That's where the sensors are behind it. Uh, we realized, with all the materials research we did, doing the first generation, that we actually could basically hide it, make it invisible. Uh, and this is it's a really nice plastic uh, with a really nice hard coat, and you don't even know it's there. And you're standing two feet away, it's gone. It's awesome. Design things that we were annoyed about. We were really annoyed about this, by the way. So it was too thick. And I, I, like, I know like, people like, always harp on Apple, like, oh my god, Apple, one, per, one millimeter thinner, like, big deal. Like, this was a really big deal. Like, we had to do it. Like, people were walking by, and sometimes they, they'd bump it. And like, like, it's way too, it's, we, we, got, we got to thin it out. So uh, the realization we had is uh, all the work that we did on the first generation, learning about the materials and stamping metal and machining, you know, we realized that this ring that we'd use for control, we could just make the whole freaking product out of that. And not only is it thinner, but it looks better, it feels nicer, it feels more premium, it's easier to manufacture. It was a win across the board. Like, we knew we had to do that. And the biggest one, of course, is, oh, I love it. It's so big. Uh, and it's, it, it is expensive. I mean, it's the most expensive part of the product, but it's really nice. I mean, there, are, there aren't too many products that are made of solid stainless steel, at least not anymore. Things we did along the way. So uh, even in our first year, uh, we changed hardware three times. So we launched with this guy. Uh, and Early customers, so people think like hardware can't be agile. Hardware can be really agile. So we launched with this guy. Uh, you push the button, you put the wire in. And what we, we learned after we did thousands, tens of thousands of installs, it's a hell of a lot better if you push the button here so you know, your hands aren't on top of each other. So we made this change really fast. So this is, this is lightning speed for hardware in terms of like design, qualification, tooling, iterating. This is lightning speed. And night and day, right? Like, Cleaned up the design, made it simpler, added two more connectors for compatibility. Again, like this is like lightning speed for hardware. Uh, but we had to do it. If we didn't do it, someone else would. If we weren't capturing that extra 25% of the market with the additional compatibility, someone else would. Software updates. Again, this is like I, I, the first time we did this, I think people were shocked. Like, my thermostat is updating its software. What the hell is going on here? <laughs> like, 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 uh, and this is something we've done now 14 times since we've launched. So 15 months, 14 software updates, that's, that's again, that's pretty fast. Uh, and we've done you know, bug fixes, we've done feature releases, we've done major releases where we added entirely new software stacks and analytics. Uh, and we did this with a thermostat. So uh, again, like, blow it up, it's like 10x. Like, how can you do it entirely, you know, entirely differently? Uh, we got a lot of value this way. People got really excited about this. We, like, we did a major software update in April of last year where we had this feature called Airwave, which Reduces your AC runtime, uses the fan instead. It's really simple in concept, but it actually requires everything we did beforehand to actually make it work. And we did it for free for everybody. Uh, and it was a big hit, saved people lots of energy. And our competitors are never really getting close to this. It's awesome. Yes. So how do you get people excited? Well, we just did a lot of that, right? Uh, but it takes more than that, right? 
you got to think about the whole experience. Like, we, we can make a great gadget, and we can do some great UI for it, but uh, that's not how you buy it. That's not how you figure out what to buy. Like, there's, there's a whole experience behind that. So we did packaging. Uh, literally, we have our own packaging designer in-house. Super great guy, also from Apple. Uh, so it's, it's actually, instead of being kind of the plastics and normal things, we made it out of bamboo. It's really nice. Recyclable. All the things you need to install it. Like, give people no excuses not to buy it. So like the giant trim plate to cover up the crappy thermostat used to have. Like, there's all, like, I'm, I, 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 like all the paint chips and holes. Like, no excuses. Like, we, we covered that base. You don't have the screwdriver. Everyone's got a screwdriver. We'll give you one of those, too. Like, literally everything. Uh, like to the screws. So I love, I love the story behind the screws. So these screws uh, were actually a work of great engineering. So have you guys ever installed things into drywall? There are these crappy anchors that you kind of slowly get in there, and a screw you put in the anchor, and they break, and it's really annoying. Uh, we didn't like them either. So we designed our own screw. So we figured out kind of what thread depth you need and how many threads you need to kind of bite into drywall or plaster or wood to kind of address all people's homes. Uh, and we did it in mass, and we patented the shit out of it, and now we have a great screw for installing thermostats. Uh, again, like, out innovating ourselves. Control, like, people want, people want control, want to do a great UI for it. We, it's about the whole experience, not just about the product and how you install it, but how you use it every day. And a lot of people, I was actually amazed, like, how many people check their thermostat every day, every week? It turns out, like, 80% of our customers check at least once a week, like, with the web app, right? Like, it blows my mind. Right? It's thermostats. It's the most boring industry out there. Uh, and we did it because we added interesting things for you to check on. You look for the leaf. You could see how much energy you used and why. You click over here and it says, you were away, you used less. Great. Uh, how could you do that before? You used to have this dumb round thing that wasn't even connected to the internet. Like Not to mention it could compute how long it was on for or why based on weather forecasts. You could do it on mobile. So shrink it down. Make it look similar. Make it feel like a family. So that when you buy the package in store, you look at the point of sale display, when you install it, uh, when you first compare it to the account on the web, all this stuff feels the same. It feels like it's from one family. Uh, as companies grow, often you kind of lose that. Where like you could tell that the app was made by a different division than the guys who made the web. Uh, it doesn't make any sense. Like you gotta build the stuff together. And that's kind of the advantage of the Apple way is kind of having one or two or three guys kind of in the room saying, what the fuck are we doing? Like, like we, can't, we, can't, we can't go three different directions. Let's pick one. So this is a thermostat company's web page. Uh, I don't know if you guys have ever been to Honeywell.com. Probably none of you have. Uh, uh, it's kind of 1980s web. It's like white with like a frame on one side and a frame on another. Uh, it's got a lot of red, and it's really hard to even figure out where to go or what it is. And uh, we want to make it really simple. So you go to the website, and that's the product. That's it. Click Learn More. As we add new products, maybe we just add them there. Right? How hard could it be, right? Uh, telling the story is the most important thing. Showcasing the product, like, I, it always blows my mind how some people don't get this right. Like, uh, have the product sell itself. Like, great marketing should not be putting lipstick on the pig. It's about selling the beautiful thing that you made, right? Uh, so, it's been a journey. I mean, it's for like for for Tony and I, it's been almost three years now. Uh, for the team, it's been almost two. Uh, and it's been a hell of a ride, and uh, I feel like we're just getting started too. Like it's one of those like a lot of you guys are in startups, so like, you know this feeling. Like you're always behind. Like no matter how fast you go, like you're still behind. And there's 18 things that we're not doing that we should be doing. Uh, I feel like we're in that mode, and like there's so many different things we should be doing. People, I cannot tell you how much feedback we get. Like why is, why aren't you guys doing this product and this product or this product? Why don't you guys do this? So, like holy cow! Like we gotta do one thing at a time. Let's do it really really well. And over time, we'll out innovate ourselves and we'll replace ourselves and we'll do new things, but one thing at a time. We don't want to get too big for our britches. So I uh, want to take your questions. So I'm extre you can tell I'm extremely casual, like literally like all fair game. Just yeah, like, I I'd love to you know, hear what you have to say. Sure. So why the number 70? Uh, so so if you guys have ever bought a watch, how all of the watches always have the display, kind of the pen and the two, it looks nice. Uh, we picked 70 because it looks nice. Yeah. Yes. Sure. Um, let's say you build the best thermostat in the world and you're ready for your next adventure. What would be next for home automation? Ah. Uh, so, uh, it's a funny story. So, we don't even consider ourselves home automation. So, like, as I said earlier, like, I told Tony, let's do a smart home company. He said, 
retarded. Why would we do it? No one wants to do the smart home. It's geek stuff. So uh, if we were doing another product, what would we do? I think we'd follow the same idea. So we'd find something that's unloved, that hasn't changed in 20, 30 years, that's critical in people's lives, that we could add a lot of value and really do better. And maybe we're doing something like that or some things like that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so, 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 oh, yes. So, so the question is, is uh, before we, we had the round and the thermostat, like, how did we get there? Uh, and we actually, we started with thermostats. Like, like, we knew that it was a major problem. It's half of home energy. Like, there's nothing out there you could buy. Uh, we could build a whole company around that. Like, if we did nothing else, if we only built a thermostat company, that would be a big business. Sure. Uh, Ah, so design. So, so yeah, how do we design the interface? So uh, we hired a really smart guy. I don't know if you guys have heard of Mike Mattis. He's a really, really smart guy. So he's at Facebook now. He started his own ebook company before that that Facebook then bought. Uh, he's a really smart designer. We knew him from Apple. And Tony and I got him together, and we're like, like, this is the idea we have. How should we do it? We want to make sure it's really easy for people to understand. Uh, and he drew some sketches so like on the whiteboard right there. And drew a circle and put a number in the middle. So that's it. And uh, <laughs> we're, like, uh, we're like, OK, that's crazy. Uh, but we, then we talked about it for about three weeks. And we did some more sketches. We did some renderings. Uh, and I wish I had a whiteboard. I would draw it. Like, basically, what we ended up with was a number uh, inside a metal ring. And the screen went to the edge. Uh, and that was the whole product. It was like one millimeter thick. It was a designer's dream. Uh, and then we had reality set in. And we're like, oh, we got to have display borders because that's what, how displays work. You have to have the driver ledge and all those kind of things. And it can't be one millimeter really thick because you need connectors and all, all those kind of things and batteries. Uh, and we got to basically where we ended up from this vision of the most simple pro- product we possibly could build, which is a number and display with a ring. And eventually, maybe three, three years down the road from now, we'll get there where we just have kind of a ring on the wall and the numbers go to the edge and it's all display and it's beautiful and uh, uh, I hope we get there, actually. That, that, that's the goal. Yeah. Sure. Go ahead. So, uh, earlier, you gave me a couple statistics about uh, energy usage, and you had made this like, 50% for uh, industrial and 20% for residential. residential. Yeah. Yes. I'm curious why you chose residential over energy. Ah, so uh, given kind of that residential is only 20% of the energy pie, why do we pick residential? And it has to do with DNA. So, uh, Tony and I have consumer DNA, and that's really all we have. I mean, we, we, like, there are great companies actually uh, looking at the, the, law, at the commercial space, the enterprise space, the industrial space, uh, but it's not our DNA. Like, we, could do, we could do great stuff there, but uh, we want to spend a lot of time and money and thought and design on consumer experience, and the things that you do in kind of the enterprise space are different. Uh, the guys who operate factories, they want dashboards, they want control, uh, it's a very different kind of experience than what we've designed. And I, I, our DNA is very consumer. It's all we really know how to do. Sure, go ahead. Um, besides updating software, yes. um, you know, on the fly off the internet, yes. what other um, benefits do customers get from being connected? Sure. And what do you get from being connected? Right, so, so what benefits do we get from being connected and what great things do we do for consumers? So I talked about remote control and kind of the, you know, the, kind of the, the app analytics. Uh, but we did something deeper, actually. So we started doing this in October. Uh, we sent a monthly energy report. So your thermostat sends you an email every month saying uh, how much energy it used versus last month, uh, how much energy Nest has saved overall as a whole, uh, why it used so much energy. If it went up or down since last month, why? Was it the weather? Was it you actually turned it up more? You're using more heat? Uh, was it you were away less or more? Like, what other factors were involved here? Was it a longer month? Sometimes that matters, right? Uh, give you some tips on how to actually save more. Uh, and we do this because we have enormous scale data analytics at this point. So all our thermostats are setting up their data, kind of temperature, occupancy, humidity, uh, all the different schedule set points you do. And we're looking at this at a very broad scale. And being able to do that means we can start doing these kind of analytics, giving people information instead of just what, why. So the what would be like, this is how much energy used. But the why, I think, is the important thing. Uh, actually, there's a great TED talk. If you guys have not watched it, there's a great TED talk about the why and how you could design and do marketing based on the why instead of the what, and it's much more effective. It's a, it's a really good talk. If you haven't watched it, please do. Uh, so the why. So why your energy used went up was, is, is much more important than, than what. And uh, this is something that 
I think most energy companies have gotten wrong in the last 10 years. There's a lot of energy dashboards, and these like uh, Microsoft Home and Google Power Meter, and they give you these dashboards, like how much energy used. But why? That's the important thing. Like, what? What am I supposed to do about it, right? So the reason we added the why, and through all our data analytics are able to do it, we can tell people the why. Sure, go ahead. So, uh, so, 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 so uh, I worry about everything and everybody. I, 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 it's, it's definitely not regional. Uh, I worry about everything. So the reason why we move fast is we want to make sure that even if they copy what we just did, that we've already moved ahead three generations. So it always looks old. So I, I, I used to spend a lot of time in China for Apple, and we'd shop in kind of the giant mega malls in Shanghai and Shenzhen, and you'd see kind of these little white sticks that look kind of like iPods, never really quite the same, but like, it looked like three years ago iPod. Like they, they'd call it like the MP4 player, like it was one better, and all those kind of things, and, and uh, it, it looked old because we'd already innovated three generations. So I mean, I'm, I, I'm, yes, I'm worried about people copying, but as long as we keep moving fast, we never have to worry about it. Sure. Oh, yes, I love that question. So the question is, why the name Nest? Uh, and it's because it was the absolute best name we could, we could have. So, uh, which is why we picked it. So, uh, so what does Nest mean? What, is it, what, is it, what does Nest mean to you? Uh, it means home. It means warm. Uh, it's where people, you know, comfort, right? It's, it's where birds lay their eggs. It's where they, it's where they keep their home. Uh, and it's the perfect brand to build a home technology company. Uh, like, there is no better name. Like, we, we racked our brains. We couldn't come up with anything better. Like, uh, it's not tech. It's not design, it's a little bit of everything. It's, it's tech, design, and home kind of all melded into one. Oh, really? We have uh, time for one more. Sure. What kind of OS runs on a thermostat? So uh, on this thermostat? So what kind of OS runs on this thermostat? Uh, we run Linux, actually. So actually we run two OSs. So uh, that, that backplate where you put the wires actually runs its own OS, too. So like, like, like the place where you put the wires actually runs software. So that thing runs our own proprietary kind of small RTOS, but the big guy runs Linux, actually. It's like a really old version of the kernel, but it's pretty rock solid, so we don't really change it much. Cool. All good? Uh, one more? Uh, sure. Do you want to do one more? In the back. Ah, yes. So ch chances are the power. Yeah, yeah. So if the internet goes down, nothing happens. It still works great. So uh, uh, part of the worries we have, we worry a lot, that's kind of our again, DNA of the team, uh, is that what if, what, if, what if the power is out? What if the wireless goes down? What if the internet provider goes down? It still has to work great. So we actually do all the learning and all the intelligence on the device. So I guess there's some analytics we do in the cloud for kind of large scale processing, but uh, everything you need works great unconnected. So you can install the device and never connect it, it works great. But if the power goes out, uh, chances are your heater's not working either. So I mean, nothing we can do about that one. <laughs> so. It, been great. Uh, been a great crowd. Thank you so much for having me. Uh, and I hope you guys love your mess. Huge yeah. thank you to Matt. Yes.